Welcome back, everybody. It's lecture 13. That means we only have three more weeks, which means you guys have to be getting ready to uh, start presenting pretty soon. I think we're supposed to be having preliminary presentations next week, so we have time to do uh, some rounds of revision. So I hope people can get some things done. I think, Juliana, you were going to show people a little bit about how to do uploads today, right? That's great. So I need to remind you, as usual, that we're being live streamed and recorded. So please be aware of that. Today, we'll work primarily on uh, using network models inside of CompuCell. And this is going to be at a little bit of a diversion from the kinds of things we've been doing so far. And it's also going to be, to some extent, uh, a very, very short summary of a whole semester's worth of class. Uh, but really the, the amount of information you need to be able to do this is not large. And so we can, I hope, really do some useful things in a semester, in, in a class. So we're going to talk a little bit about uh, what network models are, uh, how they're represented computationally, mathematically, and then uh, I'm going to tell you a little bit about how to convert networks into equations. I originally had quite a few slides on this topic, but I think it's going to seem a little abstract uh, if I do too much of that at the beginning. So what I'd like to do is go through that relatively quickly and then do some coding. And then we can come back to some of these more formal issues about how do you convert a network to an equation uh, and what does it mean. Uh, perhaps next week. We're going to be using uh, a simulation that was written by Josh, if I remember right, Joshua Ponte Serrano, uh, that lets you run antimony and tellurium inside of CompuCell. And for this week, we're not going to worry about how that works inside of CompuCell. It's not very difficult, but but we'll we'll neglect to some extent, the, uh, the complexity of that. And we'll see how far we get with some exercise. And I know I keep promising you homework assignments and then not delivering them, but I'll do my best. So maybe we'll start out with some project updates. Alex, how is the, how are things going for you? Uh, long and complicated. Um, I haven't made much progress, mostly because I've been uh, busy with other things, but uh, there are a lot of like uh, open GL rendering classes and whatnot in VTK, but I was just struggling finding documentation on how to use them. Uh, like, cause a lot of it seems that um, you provide, cause VTK has uh, data structure classes as well. So like, it's generally just you provide them, you just, you fill the data structure class with your information and then you pass it to VTK and then VTK internally has already picked out a device to render on. Um, so whether or not it's able to like, if, if we're able to like already have the data on GPU and call VTK with that, like a pointer to that in some way, I'm not I'm not sure at the moment how that can happen. But I don't know if it, it maybe it can, maybe it can, I just don't know. Just don't. So I've been digging into that. I mean, that, 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 that's, that's outside of my, my area of technical competence. TJ, is probably the only person who would, who would be locally available. Machek might uh, have some help, be able to help with that. I know he did, I mean, I don't, not in the context of specifically VTK, but I know he did some of the GPU accelerators for CompuCell in the old days. So, uh, but, but whether he's kept up to date on that or not, I don't know. I don't know whether I'm happy or disappointed to learn that even, even, Fancy commercial software isn't documented as well as it could be. Well, so, I mean, there's documentation out there, but then when you have like five different classes that have the same name and they don't really describe what is the class for, just like a bunch of functions and there's so much inheritance going on. Yeah. So I think I mean, it sounds like it's basically written for users, not for developers. I mean, the users are developers. Oh, okay. <laughs> I mean, 
I mean, TJ was talking about this the other day in the context of using something like TensorFlow, which is when it works is tremendous, but if there are issues, it's harder to know what, what's going on. Yes, that is, that is a good definition of TensorFlow. I would agree. So, okay. Well, th I hope, I hope I mean, we appreciate what you've been doing. I hope, I hope we're, we're able to, to keep going. Yeah. Even if not, I think you've already done a lot. So I'm not gonna... I hope I'm not wasting my time on this either, or on this, but there's probably some gold nuggets in there somewhere. Josh, how are things going for you? Uh, they're going well. I was able to add a steering panel and everything. Now I just have to decide which parameters to, because there's a lot. So I just have to decide which parameters I want to be, or the most important ones and stuff like that. And then, uh, but I got it working fine. Great. Well, if you want to meet with me or you want to meet with Giuliano, just just let us know or if you want to show something in class to discuss that that's all fine whatever okay. works best for you yeah I'll, i can uh, set up a meeting if i need anything okay. joel yeah this week was a little bit more complicated for me to do anything on the on the project compared to what i did on the last week so i actually don't have a lot to report and Connor. So um, let's see. I, in terms of getting the base simulation that we're trying to replicate done, I could be wrong, but I think everything is working except for two features. Um, and those two, uh, I spent um, this past weekend getting everything running smoother. There were a couple of glitches that were happening and those are all gone now. So the last things that are left is that um, I, I caught that there's an error in the slope of our gradient relative to what they did in the paper for the season initialization. And that might be why the chemotaxis is giving some trouble. Um, I think Andrew is working on that right now. Um, and also it ends up that the, um, after we met with you and Giuliano, the ligand binding site stuff in the paper is a little bit more complicated um, than what we did, but I'm still playing around with it. Um, so I, I think that'll be okay. And, you know, if, if not, I'll say something, but we're definitely, it's a, it's a slow uphill push, but we're definitely making progress. Well, so I hope the basic adhesion idea worked. I mean, that I think, I think the, and I'm happy to meet again and go over details if, if it winds up being tricky to implement. Yeah, I, I think, um, the, there's one thing that I'm still trying to figure out whether it's me um, interpreting it off um, or if it's actually in the paper. So I'm not going to say anything about that yet. Um, the major um, thing that I was running into is that um, it wasn't really happy with the way I was trying to get it to interact with the mitosis steppable. Um, so I'm that that's the primary part that I'm still playing around with. So I think there is some complication with inheritance when you do when you do uh, mitosis when you're using adhesion flux. So we may have to do some playing around to make sure that the, the inheritance pattern is structured correctly. Because it, according to the manuals, that's one of the few things that doesn't actually get copied correctly when you do cell division. We'll have to look at that. And, and doing the mutation is always a little bit tricky. There's some, some, some complications that you run into. Okay. Well, I'm glad that uh, everybody is still here. Uh, I, know, I know as the semester goes on, things, projects pile up. And so I'm glad to do that. So just for review, I mean, I think last time we were focusing on this idea of the external potential plugin and persistent cell migration. And the main thing that we were discussing last time, although it's not the only thing you could use that external potential for, we could use the external potential for something like uh, a pump or 
gravity is that cells, when they move, don't move in a purely diffusive way. They have a persistence time. And that persistence time is the result of the fact that they build motors, macromolecular machines that move them in a particular direction. And those macromolecular machines, while they are assembled and disassembled, uh, have some lifetime, typical lifetime. It could be 15 seconds, it could be a few minutes. 30 seconds to a minute is typical. And that means that while cells will tend to change direction, uh, they'll tend to move persistently in roughly the same direction over periods of about a minute. And that defines the concept of persistence time. We haven't in this class done the mathematics of how to determine a persistence time. Uh, that's something that's worth looking up. If you've done a little bit more math or physics, it's a, it's a set of concepts that's uh, interesting and useful uh, related to the idea of uh, temporal autocorrelations. Wikipedia has a good article on it. And there are plenty of, of reviews that you can look at, uh, but it's a little bit more mathematics than I tend to do in this class. And so I'm not, not going to include it in the lectures this, this time. The other time you might want to use this is simply that the, the, the default membrane fluctuations in copy of cell are pretty small. And so the typical velocity of cells when they're moving randomly uh, through membrane fluctuations is very low. And so applying an explicit force allows you to move the cells a little bit faster. And if we want to do that, we have to load this external potential plugin in the XML. And one thing to look at is there is this center-based and pixel-based versions of it. We didn't compare those. Probably worth having a homework problem or exercising class in the future that does that. Um, and then uh, there's an attribute for each cell generated by that, um, which is lambda vec uh, x, y, and z. And those are all equal, set equal to a float. If you want to move in the positive x direction, you need to have a minus value for the uh, lambda vec x. It's the usual problem that reducing energies uh, gets you movement in that direction. So you apply a force in the, in the direction opposite to the energy increase. And so you have to remember that. Usually the most complicated thing, which we ran into last week, is that you have to convert an, an angle and a amount uh, to a pair of vectors. So you have to take some sines and cosines uh, and then multiply by, uh, by the force. So I want to move on now to talking about network models. And biology is full of scales. Uh, we're, from the chemical reactions of individual pairs of molecules uh, up to ecosystems. Uh, in this class so far, we've essentially been working at the level of cells and what they do. And so far, while we've done a little bit where we change the properties of cells, say in Python, we haven't really talked about how cells signal to each other, uh, how they're regulated, how they make decisions. What's the internal computation going on inside of a cell? And we're going to find that while the reality of what's going on inside of a cell is very, very complicated, because the cell is full of very complex macromolecular machines, the kind we were just talking about in terms of motion, um, very often we can approximate a lot of that complexity in the form of what are called pathway diagrams. It's actually a little bit surprising that pathway diagrams work uh, because they neglect all of the spatial complexity of self. Uh, but in many cases, they work pretty well. Uh, we're also typically going to neglect the stochasticity of those pathway diagrams and write them as deterministic uh, rules. The other place that you'll find network models very often in biology uh, is modeling the whole body, in particular the flow of blood and its transport, 
is a natural network model. And there are some very, very fine uh, mathematical biologists here in the Indian University system. Uh, for example, Julia Arciero up in Indianapolis, uh, who've made a career of modeling flow uh, in blood vessels and lymphatic system. And that, of course, again, blood flow modeling it with Navier-Stokes equation, actually doing hydrodynamics is mathematically and computationally very difficult. But often really what you care about is that a certain amount of fluid went from point A to point B in a time C, uh, and you wanna know how much chemical it carried with it, how much oxygen was transported, how much nutrient was transported, how much drug was transported. And those kind of networks uh, can be written in a very simplified way as uh, again, non-spatial network models. As I mentioned at the beginning or just before the beginning of the class, um, the fall class I teach, 3.32, is actually uh, an entire semester on this topic. There are many, many good textbooks on that. Uri Alon has a great book. Um, Paulson has a very good book. Uh, the textbook, if anybody's interested in taking the class, you're welcome uh, in the fall. Um, the textbook that I use is one by our old friend and collaborator, Herbert Sauro, University of Washington, uh, called Systems Biology and Introduction to Pathway Modeling. Uh, this is a fairly elementary textbook, um, but it gets the key ideas across, I think, in a very clear way. Um, if people need a copy of it, uh, you can buy it online. If you need just to see a chapter, I have a PDF, so share a chapter or two with you if necessary. Uh, Herbert uh, writes a uh, modeling language and a Python library for solving this kind of network model. Uh, the language is called Atomony. The library is called Tellurium. Herbert likes to come up with new names for languages. Oh, he has invented many languages over the years. Uh, they all look pretty much the same when you look at them in detail. Uh, I hope Herbert's listening on this call. Uh, and uh, one thing that Herbert has done, which I, I rather admire, is he has superb online documentation. And so for any of the things that you need, um, I really strongly recommend going to Tellurium, read the docs, and going to the documentation. Excellent. Wonderful demos, wonderful examples, uh, wonderful explanations. Um, you could do a lot with this language. We're not going to need most of that. We're going to do simple things. Uh, but if you really want to learn how it works, that's good. If you want to know more about the mathematics and some of the principles, this book is good a place to start. As I say, there are a lot of good textbooks, but I think Herbert's is the best introductory one. There's also a cheat sheet, uh, Tellurium Antimony cheat sheet, which is everything you need on one page. And really, this time, it's simple enough. CompuSo is a little too complicated to put on one page. Delirium antimony, everything you need to know really fits on one page. In fact, on one side of one page. Uh, in that sense, it's beautiful because it's very simple. Um, and that is available in the uh, student materials folder. I've put it there. I've also uploaded it to Canvas. And I encourage you, uh, when you're working with this, to, to download that and print it. It's always nice to have it on your desk as a, as a reference. And then refer to the manual for, for additional work. So today we're going to focus on a very few simple ideas and, and doing some very simple modeling. Some people have already done this. I mean, Joel and, and, uh, and Andrew have been working on it quite a bit. Um, so this will be a bit of a review. And Joel, if I make a mistake, you can correct it. And maybe the other thing to say, although they'll come back to it, is that when I teach Tellurium and Atomony, uh, Tellurium is a freestanding Python library. And so we normally, when I teach it, I'll still use NanoHub, but we'll run inside a Jupyter Notebooks environment. 
and that has a lot of advantages. Uh, for the purpose of this class, we're going to be running the tellurium and antimony inside of CompuSol because the goal eventually is to hook up these network models with CompuSol models. Uh, and since we're not going to be doing a lot of the things that are fun to do with, with, the, with the Jupyter Notebook version, uh, we'll just jump ahead. We'll save basically a lecture's worth of time by not switching environments in the middle. Uh, if you want to get seriously involved with these kind of network models, uh, running them in Jupyter Notebooks is probably not a, is a good idea because you have additional features and, and, and capabilities. Uh, but uh, for today, we're going to be sticking inside of Compass. Uh, when we look at uh, biological networks, they all have the same concept as all, all conceptual organization as networks. And again, if we did the fall, I would talk a lot about networks as a concept. What is a network? What does it mean? Um, but today we're going to skip through a lot of this material rather quickly. Uh, the main kinds of chemical networks we're going to be dealing with would be chemical reaction and metabolic networks. These are uh, essentially chemical reactions that create and destroy the components of cells and tissues. Metabolism is the most uh, well known. And those typically operate on timescales of milliseconds to seconds. And then if you look here at the top, here's a picture of a network. And this is, I should know what I picked. This is sort of a random snippet of, of the, the, the metabolic network. Uh, you see fructose, glucose, these are sugar, sugar metabolism. The second kind, which is one we run into much more in CompuCell. So the metabolic networks typically are the things that are the equivalent of the engine in your car. And when you're driving, you typically don't care about how the engine works as long as it's working. You care about its power output. You care about maybe how fast your car accelerates. But fundamentally, the details of the spark plugs and the, and the machining of the engine don't matter. And so a lot of the time, you will take metabolic networks for granted. As long as they're working, they're working. They're producing energy for our cell, they're producing material for our cell, but we're not going to dig inside of them. Metabolic networks are extremely complicated. And there's a whole set of mathematical approaches called uh, flux balance analysis that are used uh, to do metabolic network analysis, which are sort of specialized. The things that we will talk about much more uh, in the context of this class and we're not going to have time to do too much because we're not, we don't have that many lectures left. But in terms of the kinds of things you do with CompuCell, uh, one of them are signaling networks. And signaling networks typically are networks that transfer information between cells and within cells. Because as with neurons, uh, you have to convert uh, a neuronal action potential to a chemical signal at the boundary between two neurons and then back to an action potential on the other side. Um, signals have to get sent from a cell through the extracellular space, be received by cells and then responded to. And so there are really two components always to a signaling network. What happens outside of the cell and what happens inside of the cell. Uh, depending on the particular type of signal, it can be transduced in a lot of ways. But something that you'll find is very, very typical is that you'll have a receptor, a transmembrane receptor, where the outside of the cell, there's a component of the receptor. That receptor will bind to a chemical in the environment. That binding will change the shape of the receptor that will release a molecule on the inside of the cell. And that molecule is often something called a kinase. And those kinases then go on and do what's called phosphorylation. They'll attach phosphates uh, to chemicals, either turning them on or off. And you can get what are called phosphorylation cascades. And that's a classic signaling network. And those typically operate on timescales of seconds to minutes. The next kind of networks 
are gene regulatory networks. Uh, these typically turn genes on and off. And there is a little bit of complication which we typically will ignore about gene regulatory networks. One of them is that we'll typically treat them as continuous in their operation, even though they're usually either turned on or off. Uh, and again, there are what are called Boolean, stochastic Boolean models that uh, embrace the fact that uh, the gene is either being transcribed or it's not. Uh, the other thing that you have to deal with with gene regulatory networks is that while you typically have something concept that a molecule A causes production of protein B, Production, and we'll come back to this, takes many steps. And we often will neglect those intermediate steps. On the cover slide, I grabbed a picture of a one gene and its regulation. Uh, there's a tendency now to use this kind of uh, uh, SBN or biotapestry notation that's an attempt to make genes look like uh, integrated circuit uh, logic gates. They don't really work like that. They're really much more complicated than that. And so uh, this diagram here is a tremendous oversimplification of what really happened. Uh, the reason that you see this line and then this arrow coming out of it is that this line is meant to represent DNA. Um, the arrows at the back represent the promoter sequences that turn that expression of that gene on and off, transcription of that gene on and off. Uh, the arrow on the output side is meant to represent the RNA transcript of that gene coming off of it. And here, even in this little picture, you'll see that there are multiple, potentially multiple sites uh, on a gene, some of which turn it, turn it on, some of which turn it off. And of course, there's a lot of complex interaction. Uh, gene regulatory networks and signaling networks are often very closely coupled to each other, uh, but they do have some specific differences. Because of the fact that turning a gene on has steps, and again, we'll come back, and probably hear me say the same thing again in three minutes, uh, the so-called fundamental dogma in biology. Um, uh, gene regulatory networks typically operate on timescales of tens of minutes to hours. And the last kind of network that we will sometimes talk about, uh, which Giuliano's worked on, his first paper is about this, um, are what are called physiologically based pharmacokinetic networks. And this comes back to the idea of transport of molecular species within the body, typically on much larger scales than we're dealing with. Uh, you swallow a pill, the pill dissolves in your gut, it's absorbed in the wall of your gut, it gets into your bloodstream, the blood spreads it through your body, it's metabolized and excreted by your kidneys and your liver, and you want to know the lifetime and distribution of that molecule. All of these can be written in the same mathematical form, which in a sense is rather amazing. Uh, but as you can see, just graphically, they all have nodes connected by arrows. Now exactly what those nodes mean and what those arrows mean will differ in different cases, but the basic concept of being a network and being a dynamic network, because if you've done library science or certain kinds of analysis in the Network Science Institute here, uh, they tend to think of networks as static things. They're focused on the architecture of the network. In our world, we're going to be focused on the dynamics, what's happening on those nodes and how they're changing in time. Of course, both things are important. It's not to neglect the importance of architecture. So let's talk <clears throat> a little bit about chemical reaction networks and what they represent. Um, a chemical reaction network, <coughs> excuse me, typically represents a series of chemical reactions. Uh, those can be written in the form of chemical formula. Here are two molecules of ADP, adenosine diphosphate, can give us one molecule of adenosine triphosphate and adenosine monophosphate. So this is the classic reaction 
ATP is the energy currency of the cell. And so this is one of the most fundamental reactions in biology. It's a reversible reaction. You can go either way. You can have a cascade of these. Two molecules of A make B. B can make three molecules of C. C can combine with A to make D, and so on. That can be written diagrammatically. Uh, in some cases, when you have what's called stoichiometry, how many molecules of each species are used? You have seven molecules of A plus nine molecules of B goes to 10 molecules of C. Seven, nine, and 10 are called stoichiometric coefficients. Sometimes people have tried to use little arrows to indicate the numbers. Uh, works okay when it's one, two, or three. It doesn't work so well if you have 15. Uh, and there, we'll find out that there are some uh, ambiguities in this notation, which we'll have to deal with. So in this case, an arrow represents a flow of mass. We're destroying A and producing B. We're destroying B and producing C. A and B are being destroyed and converted into D. And so these arrows represent mass change, mass transformation or mass flow. Uh, the nodes typically represent either the amounts or the concentrations of molecular species. Uh, and there is some complication because switching between amounts and concentrations is not as simple as it might seem. Because you have to, to do that, you have to know what volume you're in. If you're in a single test tube and the volume is always the same, it's easy. Uh, if you're in the body, it may not be so obvious what volume you're talking about at a given time. And you'll find that in the literature, they're not always consistent in the way they talk about it. Um, so in this case, the node is a molecular species. The state of the node is the amount or concentration of that species. The link represents a chemical transformation. Uh, the left-hand side is called the substrate, and the right-hand side is called the product. So the input is called the substrate, the output is called the product, and the arrow itself is called a reaction. And reactions have associated with them a rate, and that rate is called a rate law, and typically it will depend on the amounts or concentrations on the left-hand side, not typically on the right-hand side. And there's something that one has to get used to, which is that if you have a double-headed arrow, a reversible arrow, uh, we're going to interpret that as two separate things. A, C plus A goes to D, one re reaction and rate, and D goes backwards to C plus A is a second one. And the notation in the world is a little bit inconsistent about that too. Uh, I will always try to write the reaction rates next to the arrows. I, I won't promise that the world is consistent about doing that. Uh, mathematically, those reaction rates uh, create a set of mathematical structures called reaction kinetics. Uh, typically, these are in the form, your change, the rate of change of a concentration, dA by dt equals some rate law. Uh, in this case, if I have A and B combining to make C, the natural thing is that the rate of which it, that happens depends on A and B. If I write an arrow just like this with nothing else, by default, that means that this reaction depends only on the amounts of A and B. It depend on a bunch of parameters, but not on any other variables. Uh, if we want to go further than just say there is some rate, we have to say what kind of rate there is. Um, if it's chemical reactions, the simplest rate, which is often a reasonable approximation, is something called mass action, which says that the rate is a constant times the concentration or amount of A times the concentration or amount of B. In this case, really, you mean probably concentration rather than amount. This makes some sense because if you don't have any A, you can't have the reaction. So it better go to zero when there's no A, better go to zero when there's no B, better always be positive. And that means around zero, 
the first order form is always going to be linear in A and B, bilinear in A and B. As you get to higher concentrations, you can have saturation and other things. We can talk about that another time. And so if I write A plus B goes to C with no other information, the default would be that dA by dt is minus KAB because that arrow is destroying A, minus KAB for B because it's destroying B, and KAB for C because I'm creating it. Notice that if I just think of molecules, the number of molecules is not consistent because I destroyed two molecules to make one on the right. Mass is conserved, but molecule number is not. Okay. So if I now look, that's all I'm going to say for the moment. As I say, I have whole slide decks on each one of these, which I'm skipping for today. Uh, Giuliano encouraged me to skip more, but I'm going to give you a little bit of background. So I mentioned already that um, signaling is critical for cells to respond to their environment. We've talked about things like chemotaxis. And chemotaxis is a classic response of a cell to a chemical signal. Um, the way that chemical signal is transduced uh, leading to the cell response is something we haven't talked about. We've just assumed it's there. And there are all sorts of molecular receptors on the surface of the cell that send signals inside the cell that promote things like actin polymerization to push the cell in a given direction. Uh, the top example here is one that we will probably do in class next week. Uh, it is a molecular species called delta and notch. This is now not a signal to a diffusing chemical, but a contact signal between two cells. There's a molecular species called delta, uh, which is on surface of cells. There's another molecular species on not called notch, which is also on the surface of cells. We've talked a little bit about uh, things like cadherins, which are cell adhesion molecules. They also send signals. They don't just stick cells together. These things are always mixed up in biology. They're never separated. In engineering, you try to separate function. You try to have what's called orthogonality. Biology things are never orthogonal. Functions are always mixed. And so delta and notch, when they come together, so, so cadherins and most cell adhesion molecules are what are called homophilic. They like to bind to their own, their own type. Uh, there are some molecular species like integrins, which are adhesion molecules that bind to extracellular matrix. So those are heterophilic. They like to bind to something else. A delta and notch are a classic heterophilic species. A delta and delta don't care if they're on adjacent cells. But delta and notch bind to each other. And that binding leads to a cleavage of delta. And that delta cleavage part, intracellular, um, I'm sorry, I said notch, delta, and I meant notch, sorry. Notch leads to cleavage. NICD, uh, notch intracellular domain, uh, sends a signal uh, which the cell responds to for things like cell differentiation and uh, cell proliferation. Another example about signal transduction uh, which you'll run into most of the time the specific molecular species names are not going to be important in this class. There are a few that you may run into a lot uh, are what are called kinases. Uh, typically kinases will have a K at the end of them uh, for kinase. Uh, and a kinase is something that typically will phosphorylate, will attach a phosphate to the thing it binds to. And a classic one of this is a signal that's transduced by MAP kinase kinase kinase. What does MAP kinase 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 do? When MAP kinase 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 is phosphorylated, it binds to MAP kinase kinase and phosphorylates it. And MAP kinase kinase phosphorylated binds to MAP kinase and phosphorylates it. And phosphorylated MAP kinase then turns on and off a variety of genes. And so that kind of signal transduction cascade is very common in signaling networks. Um, 
Sometimes it's the phosphorylated version of the molecule that's active. Sometimes it's the non-phosphorylated. Probably the phosphorylated one is a little bit more common. Uh, notationally, you may find a dash P for the phosphate, sometimes a star for the phosphate. We've already seen uh, transcription networks. These are the networks ultimately that determine differentiation states of cells. Although by themselves, they are not sufficient to determine differentiation. Uh, that's a myth. They're, they're necessary, but not sufficient. Um, typically, these will have uh, sites, which are called uh, promoter sites. There are things called transcription factors, which often have an X in their name. Although not everything with an X in it is a transcription factor. And not every transcription factor has an X in it. Biological nomenclature is a mess uh, because it evolved, didn't really evolve, it more grew without any real thinking. That's not fair. There, there are rules, some rules, but not a lot. And so essentially these are networks of genes that are turned on and off. You certainly, if you were, you wouldn't be alive if all the genes in your cells were turned on at the same time, or turned off at the same time. And having them turned on and off in a consistent way is, is critical. And these typically control long-term cell behaviors. Signaling will determine, say, whether the cell crawls towards its uh, target, hemataxis. Uh, GRNs control long-term things. Is the cell going to divide? Is the cell going to differentiate? Is it going to die? Although death is a little bit more complicated because it often is controlled by uh, signaling responses and metabolic responses as well. Uh, gene regulatory networks have their own notation. I already mentioned you have this concept of the gene P. It's a horizontal line. I here represents something called an inducer. Um, the arrow represents that you're producing messenger RNA. That messenger RNA then has to be translated into protein. Uh, that's the fundamental dogma of biology. Here we see an uh, RNA polymerase that's running along the DNA, producing an RNA transcript. That RNA transcript has to be edited because typically they're not their final form. Uh, some of the editing involves removing what are called introns, which are non-coding regions of messenger, uh, non-coding regions of RNA. Uh, there has to be something called a poly-A tail, a, a sequence of A's attached to the end of the RNA. That final messenger RNA uh, leaves the nucleus, or nuclear pore here. It finds a, rib <coughs> a ribosome, the ribosome then walks along that messenger RNA and synthesizes a protein based on the sequence of letters in that RNA. That protein itself then has to be edited and folded properly and translationally modified. And so that's an additional step. And so there are actually quite a few steps in this process. Uh, first, we have to make our primary transcript the primary transcript has to be edited. The edited transcript, the messenger RNA, has to get out of the nucleus. It then has to find a ribosome. The ribosome has to walk along it, form a primary transcript of the protein. The protein has to be folded and post-translationally modified. Um, so there are a whole bunch of steps here. And the idea that I promotes P, which is typically what you get in a picture, uh, is leaving out all of those steps. Uh, it's a little bit amazing that you get anything useful out of these uh, very harsh approximations, but often you can get away with ignoring that. So we're typically going to neglect translation, editing, transport, and post-translational steps. In this case, I've written the messenger RNA explicitly. Uh, the difference between this top picture and this bottom picture is there's an extra stage of delay because these things take time. So whether that time is important or not is going to depend on the scale of problem you're working on. Uh, typically, 
from the time you start turning on the gene with the promoter binding to the time you have a protein is about 20 minutes. Depends a little bit on the size of the transcript. Maybe fastest 15 minutes. If it's a very big protein, an hour. But it means that gene regulatory networks can't turn on a dime. More like turning an oil tank. They're slow. I'll talk just a few words about interpretation. Very often in a textbook, you will see something like this. P1 promotes P2. You'll see that kind of diagram all the time. What that means in the notation we were just looking at is that P1 binds to promoter site on the gene and turns on the transcription of that gene, uh, produces some kind of a messenger RNA eventually that's then turned into a protein. Biochemically, something that's rather important to know when you see a diagram like this is you notice there's a lollipop arrow. And I'll try to use lollipop arrows uniformly for, uh, for excitation or activation. It's not an arrow with a pointed head. And so this does not represent flow of material. P1 is not used up here. Uh, if the P1 comes off of the gene, it's still available to turn on another gene. And so what this represents biochemically is nothing goes to P2. Well, really what's going to P2 is the components of the RNA and the components of the protein, but we're not modeling those. Uh, and the rate law at which we produce P2 depends on the concentration of P1. And so as a chemical reaction, that would just be nothing goes to P2 and the rate depends on P1. And so that makes things a little bit tricky because you'll see these diagrams that will look the same, but the arrows mean different things and the variables mean different things. Uh, here, I've explicitly included the messenger RNA. Um, and uh, sorry, I'm wrong. I skipped the slide with the messenger RNA. Uh, here, the other thing that you have to be aware of always when you just see a picture like this is that proteins always have a finite lifetime. And so there's always an implied degradation step where P2 goes back to nothing. Uh, there may be active degradation or not, but you always have a degradation step. And, and most of the time, if you don't include that step in the model, your model will produce something meaningless. Something that we Herbert doesn't talk about so much, but the textbooks of Uri alone and others do talk about, is that there are uh, typical patterns of gene regulation. There are also typical patterns of signaling. Uh, and these are often called motifs. And some of them are very simple. Uh, gene activation, and here you'll notice I have failed to get rid of a, a pointed arrow. It should actually be a lollipop arrow. I borrowed that from Herbert's textbook without editing it properly. Uh, so here a um, chemical comes in, binds to the DNA, and turns on transcription. Here the gene is normally transcribed, a chemical comes in and turns it off. So a blunt arrow, a T-shaped arrow, represents inhibition. Here, there are two different genes that come in, two molecules that come in and turn off my gene. Uh, and I'd have to have some hypothesis about what kind of gate that is. Is that an and, an or, or something else? Gene cascades are also pretty common. I turn on gene one, the product of gene one turns off gene two. Now, go. Yeah, I have a question on the multiple control. Uh, yeah. And to, uh, it relates to your question of it's an or or an and. It will depend if each one of these genes can turn it off or both of them has to be together to turn it off. That's, That's right. Answer. So there is any notation that is different than that, that can define that or use the same notation? 
Well, there needs to be better notation about that. Because you'll see, if I look here, for example, in this uh, sea urchin state diagram here, and I look at IRXA here, mm -hmm. it has four chemical species that are turning it on. And so I really don't know at all, uh, are they all equally important? Do I need all four? Will any one turn it on? Do I need two at a time? Do they behave the same way? That's why I'm saying that this kind of notation, which makes things look like logic gates, is in fact rather misleading because the complexity, it hides a lot of complexity. Now, until a few years ago, I would have said very often, part of the reason that that is written that way is because people didn't know. Measuring these things was difficult. Uh, these days, uh, at least in some cases, they're actually able to make pretty good measurements. And so you can get what are called trans transfer functions. Where you can actually measure the amount of IRXA produced as a function of the amount of uh, TBX23, um, DLX, and so on. Uh, and actually get a, 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 a experimental quantification of the rates. Uh, you'll notice there are a lot of X's here. I mentioned transcription factors, which are the things that turn genes on and off, often have an X in their name. So you see TBX23, HOX7. HOX, HOX is something you'll run into. HO stands for homeobox. Uh, and there are a whole, in developmental biology, there are a whole class of HOX genes, which are responsible for building the body plan. Uh, and there's a consistent pattern of what they are biochemically, how they work. And, and so um, most of these names probably won't mean much. And they don't mean much even after you've seen a lot of stuff, unless you're a specialist. But Hox is a name that you'll run into. Uh, you'll see Hox 2, Hox 3. And they go up to a large number, but they're about Hox 7. Some of them are associated specifically with things like building the eye, building the kidneys building the lungs. Uh, all of those have associated Hox genes. Um, you'll also see some genes like GSC that don't have an X in them, but are transcription factors anyway. Uh, so as I mentioned, it's not perfect. Um, molecules like bump 23 or here bump 24 um, are a little bit ambiguous. Uh, it's, this is called BUMP, is bone, bone morphogenetic protein. So this is a molecular species that is secreted outside of cells and acts as a signal, uh, but also can actually turn genes on and off. And so this is a case where you have interaction between a signaling network and a gene regulatory network, which is pretty common. If there were no co connection between the two at all, of course, then, then you wouldn't, the system wouldn't work. You need to be able to couple metabolism with signaling with regulation. Uh, but, but there is some sense where these three kinds of networks uh, are closely coupled within each other and have important links between them, but not as many. The density of connections between them isn't as high. Uh, Joel, is that another question? Yeah, yeah. Uh, and those those representations are only considering as a switch, right? As you said, yes or no. There is no uh, question of um, uh, how much of that is present. And and for example, that two reactions there, the RXA and the DLX, right? right? And since one right. turns off the other and turn on the other, it, it seems that it would make sense that a certain amount should be available, right? Because other, otherwise, how DLX will ever turn on if there is no DLX ever present and stuff like that, questions like that. Right. So, so these, are, these are important and rather subtle questions, um, which we won't have time to probably go in. We could talk about more right. in, the, in the fall semester. Um, and I'm not trying to duck it. They're, they're, they're critical. At some level, there either is a transcription factor bound to that site or not. And so that's Boolean. So this is really, there really is either bound or not bound. 
The probability of its being bound, however, will depend on the concentration, in this case, of BMP2. The more BMP2 there is, the more likely it's bound to this transcription site for MSX. And so uh, we will often write a rate law that is a continuous function of the concentration of the transcription factor, uh, even though we know that reality that would be interpreted as the gene turning on and off and the probability of being on was proportional to that rate. This would be a little bit like neurons. You have a neuromodulator that increases the probability of firing, but there are plenty of models of neuronal activation that don't model individual action potentials, but they give you as the rate of firing. And so the rate laws that we're going to be writing are typically going to be the rate of transcription, even though in reality, it's either on or off at any given time. We're gonna assume that it goes on and off frequently enough that we can, we can average over that. In reality, you often can't, and there's some paradoxes that you can get from these models um, because of that assumption. But yes, absolutely, um, they're, they're very nice Boolean models. Uh, people like um, Reka Albert have made a career out of Boolean models, especially in fruit fly of these kinds of things. Uh, but, and they work very well in some cases. In other cases, continual variation is critical. Uh, in yet other cases, what are called stochastic Boolean models that try to do, actually model those, those turning on and off individually uh, are the way to go. Uh, people like Tom Helicar and Anna Nirakis do a lot of those kind of stochastic models. Um, CompuCell now has a whole package called MabBoss, which is integrated into it, which does the stochastic Boolean version of these networks. Um, I'm not going to do teach that in this semester, uh, but if people are interested, that's certainly possible to pull that in. It's available. As you mentioned, um, you can have what's called autoregulation. Here, the molecule that's produced by a gene inhibits its own production. That winds up being a pretty common thing to do. Um, what that will do is produce a, a particular amount of the chemical and keep it at a regulated level. And so then if you perturb the level up or down, it will come back. So that's, a, that's an auto-regulatory loop. You can have situations in which you have additional factors. So those transcription factors could be influenced by other things that bind to them. Here, a small molecule binds to the transcription factor, prevents it from turning the gene on. And so the net effect of this red blotch is to reduce the amount of gene product. Um, here, on the other hand, it shows phosphorylation. When the transcription factor is not phosphorylated, it's, it works, but not very well. When it's phosphorylated, it turns on the gene more effectively. And so in this case, that phosphorylation activates. Uh, anything that turns increases the rate of production of the product is called an activator. Anything that reduces it is called an inhibitor. Um, it's pretty typical that genes have what's called the basal rate of transcription. Uh, that is that even if nothing is bound to the promoter sites, there's still a small probability of that gene being transcribed and turned into protein. And so even things, so again, it's not like a Boolean logic. Even off states aren't really off and on states aren't always the same. Now, if, if uh, during differentiation, when cells really want to turn, want in quotation marks, uh, want to turn a gene off, they have ways of doing that. Uh, you can uh, methylate the DNA. That is, you can actually go in and you can mess up the DNA itself so that it can't be transcribed. And so methylation is a very effective way of turning a gene off. And when a methylated gene is off, it's off. Uh, there's also acetylation, which promotes the basal production of the gene. 
Uh, none of these, methylation, acetylation, and so on, are indicated at all in these kinds of pathways. And a big part of that reason for that is we really don't know how and why specific genes are methylated or acetylated. We know that cells have very effective ways of methylating and acetylating things that they need to do. And that stores a lot of very important information about cell state. However, exactly how methylation, and there are molecules that are known to do methylation and acetylation, not that we don't know what those molecules are, but how they partic pick a particular gene that needs to be turned on and off is not really very well understood. It's getting a little bit better understood, but not really very well understood. There are a couple of Nobel prizes still to be given in that area. Uh, another thing that happens is that the organization of the DNA itself changes. Uh, DNA is wrapped on histones. When DNA is wrapped on histones, its rate of transcription is lower than when it's not, because you have to unspool it to copy it. Uh, the histones themselves are acetylated and methylated. So methylating histones tends to turn off the things that are wrapped around the histone more effectively, and, D and acetylating them turns them back on. And again, exactly how particular histones are acetylated and methylated, why those particular ones is not well understood. And there also is actually spatial reorganization of the DNA within the nucleus. Uh, if the DNA is near the surface of the nucleus, it gets transcribed more, it's in the middle less. And how that's done is also not very well understood. One thing that is known is that all of these things are persistent. So that the, those acetylation, methylation of histones in the DNA are persistent. And one of the great advances uh, in, in molecular biology in the past 30 years was that in, in eggs and sperm, all of those signals are, not all, but almost all those signals are turned off. The DNA has all its methylation and acetylation stripped off. The histones have their methylation and acetylation stripped off. And so to make embryonic stem, induced stem cells, induced pluripotent stem cells, famous Dolly the sheep, they needed to find some way of taking cells which have all of these lockdowns of their state and getting rid of them. And the fact that that was possible is still amazing to me. Clearly, it had to be possible at some level because humans can produce eggs and sperm. So our bodies are able to do it. But the fact that it could be done in vitro is really quite surprising. And of course, as we keep reading, the ability to induce uh, de-differentiation uh, continues to advance. It's a big area of research today. Again, you don't want to de-differentiate everything because if you did, you'd die. If all your cells de-differentiated back to stem cells, your organs would stop working and you'd die immediately. So the fact that, that the fact that your organs, that your cells remember their state is important. But again, we're going to see things like something like autoregulation. And if we did the in the fall, we do something like latches or toggles where one gene induces another gene and that's understood to be differentiation. In reality, those latches are necessary to induce differentiation states, but they're not sufficient. Somehow those latch states have to be turned into these longer term persistent states. And how that's done is still not well understood. There are a lot of mysteries in biology, fundamental mysteries about how biological systems work. It's as if we didn't know how combustion worked in your car. Actually, combustion is pretty complicated, so maybe that's a better analogy than I thought, because there are aspects of combustion that aren't well understood. Okay. And then the last example was these pharmacokinetic models. These are simplifications of the very complex pattern of blood flow in the body. You have major veins and arteries, uh, these break down into smaller veins and arteries and then into capillaries. Uh, those capillaries are the things that are actually doing the work, typically in exchanging oxygen, glucose, and waste products and signals uh, with tissues. And one of the problems is that there are a lot of generations of these. 
So, so your aorta can have a diameter of this, a capillary has a diameter of five microns. How many capillaries do you need to keep up the blood flow from the aorta? It's a lot, really a lot, especially because the flow uh, scales nonlinearly with the diameter. And so here's an example of the liver. Uh, the liver has its own very special uh, blood flow. Uh, the things that are, it doesn't really have capillaries. It has something called sinusoids, which are capillary-like, but not capillaries. Uh, but typically, mathematically, we have these very simplified models where you'll have a box that says the brain, a box that says the kidney, a box that says the heart, uh, a box that says venous and arterial blood flow, um, usually you're interested in chemicals, so you have the gut, which is where things tend to come in, although you might have the skin or if you're inhaling something through the lungs. Uh, those are your inputs. And your outputs are almost always uh, the kidneys, which break things down and secrete in the urine, uh, and the liver, which breaks things down and secretes in the feces. Um, and so you have absorption through the gut or the lungs or the skin, and then metabolism and elimination through the kidneys and the, uh, the liver. Uh, other tissues will also do metabolism and break molecules down, but they can't get things typically out of the body. You can exhale things, you can sweat things out, so there's some uh, elimination that way, but typically the main elimination is through the kidneys and the, and the liver. Um, the rate laws here, uh, we have compartments. The compartments might represent blood, body, brain, liver. Uh, each one of those compartments has a volume and an amount of material in it. And typically your arrows here represent actually mass transfer. And that mass transfer is typically by flow. And so there'll be some flow rate that carries material from the blood to the body or the body back to the blood. And so you get these linear rate laws. Uh, and the thing that's typical of these kinds of things is that you actually have to watch, have to think about amounts. Uh, and uh, you'll see a lot of rescaling of variable values by volumes. Okay. In reality, as I started out, um, almost all of these biological problems require that these networks work together. If you didn't have your blood carrying oxygen and glucose around, your cells wouldn't live. Now, of course, if you're a single-celled organism, you don't have that level of transport. Or if you're an algae, you don't have that level of transport. But even plants have vascular systems of their own. Slime molds are a little bit different. They have a slightly different organization. They do flow in a very different way. They manage to have macroscopic flow without blood because they flow the cell. They flow the cytoplasm. So instead of moving, moving the fluid over your, over your cells, you move your cells over the fluid. It's a fascinating approach to, 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 to doing certain transport problems. But in any case, typically we'll have uh, those kind of transport networks at the largest scales, which supply material and take away waste, but also supply signals. We'll have more local signaling, typically through diffusion, uh, which could lead to chemotaxis or chemical response, and intracellular chemical responses through receptors, which we talked about a little bit. Then those signals aggregate and turn on and off gene regulation. Uh, and you'll also always have the metabolism of the cell a lot of that metabolism is happening in the mitochondria, which are their own special world. And so all of these things have to work together. And so most of the time, our networks won't be purely one or the other. They'll have some kind of chemical transformations. They'll have some kind of activation inhibition like signaling. Uh, very often, they'll have some induce some change in gene activity, uh, and they probably will typically in our world also require some transport of material between locations through diffusion, through active transport, through the cell carrying something. Okay, so that is 
uh, took me an hour, uh, a one hour introduction to a topic that you could spend in a biology class a whole semester on. Uh, in a, the, the class that I would typically teach, we'd spend a couple of lectures on going into the details. Um, now we're going to say that we're going to accept those networks as something we're interested in, because we want ourselves to be controlled in ways. And we're going to talk about how to write uh, mathematical and computational descriptions of those networks. And we're going to use, again, this. there are many languages for doing this. A lot of people do it in MATLAB, really bad idea, uh, or uh, Mathematica, not a bad idea. Uh, we're going to use antimony uh, as to describe our models, and we're going to run them inside of CompuSaw. And we could either run them, type them up in Twitit, uh, which is how we'll do it today, uh, or we can actually import them. There's a, a, a repository of models called sysbio.org that has thousands of network models of very important components of cells, uh, signaling networks, gene regulatory networks, metabolic networks, and so on. Once that model is loaded, uh, it'll be converted into first a set of ordinary differential equations, and then those will be solved uh, using an SPML solver library called LibRoadRunner inside of CompuSolve. So again, uh, I recommend uh, always looking for Tellurium read the docs uh, documentation and that cheat sheet that I, I, I distributed uh, to you. Uh, problem finding Tellurium is not so easy because it's a common name. Uh, but if you search on Tellurium and Sauro, S-A-U-R-O, like Sauron in, in Lord of the Rings, without the N, uh, he's Welsh. Um, in any case, uh, if, you look, if, you, if you search on Tellurium and Sauro, you'll pull up this site immediately. If you just search on Tellurium, you'll get the, the element, which is not very helpful. Okay, so... To begin with, let's do a simple exercise. Um, I don't know how many of you people are running on NanoHub and how many people are running on desktop at the moment. Is anybody running NanoHub as their primary CompuCell installation today? I'll take that as a no from everybody. Josh, Alex? No, I'm running a desktop. Okay, Alex, I assume you're running desktop yeah, too. I have desktop too. Fine. Okay. So I'll skip on the on the, the nano hub upload. Um, that saves us a few minutes. Um, so what I have here is there should be a zipped file called Tellurium uh, in the student materials demos for lecture 13, and it'll be called Animonis demos and called Tellurium. And so I'd like everybody to just take a minute um, and uh, download it. If you can't find it, Giuliano, you can probably put a link in the chat uh, for it and, and send it to people. Um, if I already have a version of Tellurium downloaded, should I still download this or is this just the, the base? Okay, offer? so, so, so. Tellurium is a is a it's a bad bad choice of name. I should have called it something like Tellurium demo. So Tellurium is a is is a Python library. And and it, it could be either run in, in Jupyter Notebooks or in, in Spider or another Python IDE. Uh, the, the Tellurium here is actually a CompuCell simulation, which is designed to let us run antimony inside of CompuCell. Okay, I'll give people just a minute. I mean, give me one second here. I'll, I'll give people a minute to get that downloaded. Uh, I'll unzip it somewhere convenient and I'll, I'll be right back. Okay, was everybody able to get that to, to load okay? So did anybody, no, anybody have problems? No? 
Okay, so we'll skip, we'll skip all of this. And so now open uh, Tellurium in, in Twitter. If you're if you're using uh, um, a different a different model editor, that's okay too. Just open it in what you like, and then uh, open the CC3D to learn about CC3D, and we'll go into the Stepable. And what we'll see in the Stepable, let me just make sure everybody's got there. Can everybody find the Stepable? It'll be called uh, Tellurium Steppables.py. And I want to make sure everybody's there before I go forward. Joel, Connor. I'm good. Uh, Alex, Josh. Okay, so if we look inside of that stepable, we'll see at the top, type Deluria model here, model equals triple quotes, which are just the definition for Python string with carriage returns in it. Because if we use single quotes, we're not allowed to have a carriage return in our string definition. Um, and so our whole model here is just a string. That has some advantages, makes it very simple. It has some disadvantages because it means finding a mistake is hard because when there's an error thrown, it won't tell you where that where the error was in the string. And then there is a dictionary, which will be called variables. And this will be correspond to the names of the variables in the simula in, in the model string. And so uh, I understand that in general. We like to know all the ins and outs of how these things are working. For now, I'd ask people just to look at this part of the code and not worry about the specific way that this works. And so why don't you all try running that simulation? Just open it up in, in uh, player and see what it does. I mean, the additional code required to make this work is not great, but to begin with, I want to focus today, I want to focus on the antimony part of things. Uh, and so I don't want to focus so much on how you get it to work with CopyCell, although it's pretty simple. So did anybody get that to run? Does anybody want to show what they got? Sure, I can no. show, I can share. No. Oh, or if, if someone else wants to do it, Joe, feel free. Just no, you and you and you and Al Connor tend to to, to 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 be the ones who show things the most. So I want to give people an opportunity. Yeah. So if someone else wants to show, I can I can stop the sharing. But that's fine. So that this shows uh, you've got a plot of two two Tellurium model variables versus time. And you'll notice the cell field is empty because we didn't have to create any cells to get this to work. Now, now, this is a lot of machinery for nothing if all we're <laughs> going to do is plot time series for antimony. Um, and it's actually less convenient than writing it in the Jupyter Notebook. Uh, but the advantage is that once we know how to do this here, we could hook it up with all of the copy of cell features without having to relearn anything. So did everybody get something like that to work or did, it, did anybody have it crash or need any additional help with that? All right, so now I want to, um, here's what you should have gotten, which Joel just showed us. As usual, sometimes you have to do some resizing and, and reorganization. Again, I've got a lot of slides here that are focused on running it in the NanoHub environment, but if you're running a desktop, you don't need all that extra information. Okay, so let's talk about, uh, the equations. And uh, if I look at the antimony, and we'll come back to the syntax in a minute, um, this is x goes to y, y goes to x. 
So this is a reversible chemical reaction. Y goes reversibly to X. Uh, each one of these rate laws is written in a very simple way. You have your arrow diagram, X goes to Y, you write X arrow Y. And then you have a rate here, B, B times X, semicolon B times X. And I guess somebody liked C, so there are a lot of semicolons in this language. You'll notice that there's a name here, J1 names the rate law, J2 names the rate law. That could be thought of just as decoration, but in fact, you could use it later on, and we'll come back to that. Um, when I name a parameter B and C, I have to give a value for it. Uh, I have to give uh, initial values for the amounts or concentrations X and Y. So why doesn't somebody just try, why doesn't everybody change the value of C? Uh, its default should be 0 0.01, make it 0 0.1. Run it again and see if it's different. Did it change anything? Did it change the equilibrium amounts of the two species? So yes, if you have the forward and the backward rate constants, then you expect, if they're equal, then you expect that you're going to have an equilibrium equal amounts of X and Y. Uh, the equilibrium concentrations of a chemical species are typically written with a star next to them. And so if I have the reversible reaction, X goes to Y, uh, the forward rate is B times X, the backward rate is C times Y. The equilibrium ratio of the amounts or concentrations would be X star over Y star is C over B. Why doesn't somebody play for a minute, just play with that, uh, change B and C, and if see if the ratios of the two amounts really do correspond to what you get there. In the case of this very simple reaction, you could do one line of algebra to derive this. Uh, if, if there were more complicated chemical reactions or rate laws, then it might take you a little more time to figure out what the equilibrium is. Notice that the final concentration is independent of the initial amount of X and Y. Depends on the sum. If I start out with 10 units of X and zero Y, here I get five and five. So it's mass conserving, but the ratio doesn't matter. Doesn't care about the initial value. So is everybody able to get that to run? You could change a parameter, run it. All right. So let's go over um, some antimony syntax and a little bit about how we use it inside of CompuCell. Um, CompuCell makes all antimony variables and parameters. And if you've named them explicitly like E0 rates, available as dictionary entries. Um, you have two kinds of, uh, SBML, you, you'll say, why do I keep, we're talking about antimony and tellurium, why do I keep talking about SBML? Perhaps it should be antimony model or tellurium model instead of SBML. So SBML, 
it stands for Systems Biology Markup Language. It was a model specification standard for doing this kind of rate law. Uh, Herbert Sauer was one of the originators of it. It's been going for 30 years now. Um, it's not designed to be human readable. It's what's called an exchange language. It's something like PDF or PostScript. People remember PostScript. Uh, it's an XML. Um, and it is, uh, it's not unreadable, it's not terrible to look at, but it's verbose because it's an XML. Um, CompuCell can read and execute SPML files. Um, it could do that before it could read and execute antimony files. And so uh, there are a lot of places where the names in CompuCell are a little odd because we've inherited an old name that doesn't make sense anymore. Uh, so this is one of those. Um, in fact, internally, antimony does get turned into SPML. And there are some importers and exporters that could convert antimony to SPML and back. Uh, SPML does have some features that are missing in antimony. Um, for example, uh, you could do a layout of an actual diagram. So if you have a picture where you have nodes, arrows, and it's laid out, SPML can save all of that layout information of the picture. Um, you lose that in, in Atomony because it's really designed to be uh, text-based. Um, there are also some annotation features in, Atom in, in SPML that are not fully implemented in Atomony. But in general, we could go back and forth. With the, 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 the simulations will run uh, equivalently going back and forth. What you lose is some of the decorators. So in CompuCell, uh, we can, one of the things that happened though with SPML was that it never occurred to anybody that there would be more than one cell in the world. So SPML models were designed to run on their own. And even the concept of having two cells like that communicate with each other like Delta Notch was not included in the original specification of SPML. In fact, the original code that uh, solvers for SPML would crash if you had two cells that were independent because they would try to do a matrix diagonalization and they would find that if you didn't have them coupled, uh, there was a divergence and the thing would crash. Uh, these days it does a little bit better than that, but it really, really, they never thought about there being more than one cell in the world. Well, if we're talking about a signaling network inside of a cell, every cell has its own signaling network. And the states of those networks will be different at every cell because every cell will experience different things. If every cell had the same network, it wouldn't be very interesting. So CompuCell is going to give us the option of putting network models into the whole environment in which case we'll just have self.sbml.model, which is what we call a free floating model. We might use that, for example, for the blood transport in the whole system. Or in our case, we might use it because we're only going to have one model. Uh, but we could also load them into individual cells. And uh, we can have multiple different SBML models running both in the whole system and in cells at the same time, uh, we're going to have to do some glue code to connect them. Uh, we don't have something like um, a workflow software like Ski Run uh, or LabVIEW, where you can draw a box and draw arrows and it automatically connects. We're going to have to do the connections by hand. However, um, if we create a variable like R here inside of our model, that model, if we've loaded it as into a cell, is immediately available as a dictionary entry, which is our sort of standard way of interacting. Cell.sbml.model, parenthesis, quote, R, close quote. And so this gives us, a, we don't have to do a get. SBML model, set SBML model. 
uh, we have those things automatically exposed as, as variables. Um, the parameters are also automatically exposed. And if we've declared the rate like E0, that's also exposed. And so we could read it right from those uh, in our Python layer without having to do any hard work. And that really makes this kind of interconnection pretty easy. Okay. So let's now um, do a little model using our, our uh, simulation uh, engine. We're going to do basically not much more than what we just did. Um, we had X goes to Y and Y goes to X. We're going to make it even simpler. We're just going to have one forward reaction, but let's do it together. This is a very simple model of infection. And this could be a model of people being infected in the world or of cells being infected in the tissue. And we're going to assume that we start out with T, uninfected cells. There's some amount of virus in the world V. And the probability of being infected of a of cell T being infected per unit time is beta rate constant times T times V. Now, this is mass action in the simplest possible form. Uh, in reality, the amount of virus would probably be used up in this reaction. If it's infecting you, it's not infecting somebody else. In practice, the amount of virus needed to infect one cell is so low compared to the amount of virus in circulation that we can ignore the fact that it's being used up, although we could easily change this. And so what I want to do is write uh, a one-line reaction T goes to I1 at a rate beta times T times V. So one thing that we're going to have to remember always when you're using antimony is that antimony is not Python. And there are a couple of minor annoyances. Comments are different. Uh, in particular, exponentiation is different. Uh, Antimony comes with sort of more C plus C, C like syntax, like the semicolon um, as a delimiter. So let's all write this. And I what I want you to do is I want you to edit your code, that XY code, to look like this. And let's just walk through what this code looks like. Uh, we're going to have the relationship re reaction. Well, let's actually, I'll do it. I've broken it out into slides. So let me walk you through it step by step. We're going to have a model string, which is going to contain our subset of the model. And that model string is always going to be in triple quotes because it's going to have carriage returns. In it. And so we're always going to have model string equals triple quotes. They could be single or double as long as it's paired. If it's single at the top, single at the bottom, double at the top, double at the bottom. And this should be on your screen in your, in your editor already. Okay, the second thing we've got to notice is their comments. And comments, I believe hash will work as a comment. So it, it's, it's adopted the Python comment now. Originally it didn't. Uh, but the classic uh, antimony comment is a double slash. And the semicolon is a break between sections or a new line. And the usage is a little bit, to me, a little bit inconsistent because using a semicolon between the rate structure and the rate law seems to be to be functionally different from the end of a, of a, end of a definition. And so if I, if I had written this language, I would not have used the semicolon there. And you'll notice there's a colon here after the name. And so we will, we will occasionally have to remember whether we need a semicolon as a delimiter or a colon as a delimiter. Um, a carriage return is also a delimiter, but as a matter of good practice, you should always put a semicolon at the end of a line. And something that I recommend in general, and this is not 
coding, but rather good practice of coding, is I recommend that whenever you write something like a rate, law, a rate constant here, beta, uh, you have as a comment the units of that variable or parameter. Uh, if you just write a number, it's incredibly easy to forget what the units are. And if you come back to it later, it's almost impossible to figure out what you did. So here, T is number of cells in units of cells. Um, the amount of virus is in units of something called TCID50, uh, which is not a very helpful, it's not, not, not a, a unit name that I would expect you to know. Uh, it winds up that actually quantifying the amount of virus is actually rather problematic. You can measure the number of virions, the number of assembled viruses, something you can do with an electron microscope, for example, or even, uh, even with fluorescent microscope in some cases. The problem is that the number of virions doesn't tell you how many infectious virus particles you have. Winds up viruses assemble themselves rather poorly. Um, and so uh, there is an operational definition of the amount of virus, which is if I take fluid with virus in it and I try to infect cells, how much of that fluid do I need to get the cells infected? And so TCID 50 is, is a definition based on, I take my virus part, my liquid with virus in it, I dilute it in factors of 10, I put it on cells, and I ask, did they become infected or not? And the concentration at which half the cells become infected is the TCID 50. It's, a, it's an ex expensive and relatively inaccurate experiment. But operationally, what you care about is not the number of particles, because those particles might be none of those particles are infectious. And you can't see whether they're infectious or not. The only thing you can do is actually do the experiment. So actually quantifying virus is quite problematic as it happens. Uh, and here is TCID 50, and I'm measuring time in units of days. So the amount of infection per TCID per day. Go to strange. Okay. Adam Money's fundamental concept is a chemical reaction. In many networks models, you will see things written fundamentally as ordinary differential equations like the bottom here. I will say it strongly, this is wrong. You should never write a network model in terms of, as ODEs. And the reason for this is fundamental. If I give you an arrow diagram with rates, you can always determine the ODEs that come from that arrow diagram unambiguously. If I give you a set of ODEs, in general, you cannot determine the network that those ODEs came from. So the mapping from arrows to ODEs is deterministic. But there is a loss of information in that mapping that cannot be reversed. And that means, and I've done this in, in that fall class, I will sometimes give people a paper by one of the greats in the field, Tyson, on cell cycle, where he published his cell cycle model as a series of ODEs. And I'll ask them to say, what were the signals and gene regulatory networks that he modeled. You can't determine it. From the paper, you cannot determine what he modeled. He knew, but, but you as a reader cannot determine it. Um, and so um, the arrows actually are the right way to write these things. What you'll find though is that a single arrow will give rise to two or more ODE components because T is disappearing and I is being created. And so that one arrow gives rise to two ODEs. 
if I had A plus B plus T goes to I1 plus I2 plus I3, then I would potentially have one arrow that affected five ODEs. And so we have to remember that while every component of the ODE corresponds to something in an arrow and vice versa, it's not a one-to-one -one mapping. And if you're used to writing things as ODEs, it may take a little bit of work to get used to thinking about things as arrows. And so you, it's worthwhile practicing. And again, in the fall, I'd give you a bunch of exercises practicing converting between the two notations. Because ultimately, if you're going to do this a lot, you need to be able to just in the in, sort of in your sleep be able to do those conversions. And it's easy to make mistakes. Once I have an arrow diagram, it's pretty easy to write it as antimony, which is one of the things I like about antimony. Uh, here I give this a name. E1 is the name, and names have a semicolon after it. I don't have to have a name, but it's good practice. And then T goes to I1, I write T arrow I1, here dash greater than. I can also use equal greater than if I prefer to have a double arrow, it doesn't change the meaning. Semicolon, and then my rate law, which I normally write over my arrow, I write afterwards, beta times T times V. And that's 98% of antimony. So it's really not hard to write. This is what I like about it. Your entire syntax you have to know is colon, arrow, semicolon, rate law, semicolon. That's it. So it's not hard. Okay. So now I'm going to write the rate law. As I mentioned, E1 names the rate law, not required, but it gives me access to the rate. E1 at any time is equal to beta times T times V. So if I want to know how fast is this conversion happening, it's available to me through the variable E1. Okay. So is everybody, now I'd like everybody to type this. If you, it, you don't have to type all the comments, but please do type the basic equation into, into your little box. So I'll give people a minute to do that. And I'll, I guess I'll launch a poll just to, to see, make sure everybody's able to get it. We have scientific notation for, uh, for constants, e, one E seven, one times 10 to the seven. Okay. I guess I'm talking too slowly. All right. I mentioned that antimony was originally designed to do chemical reactions. In chemical reactions, often you get complicated patterns of reaction. Three molecules of A plus five of B give me back one A plus two C plus nine D. In antimony, if I have a stoichiometric number like 3a, I write 3 in front of the variable name without a times. So times means, or it's what do you expect for times. The number by itself, you know, we have to remember that the exponentiation in antimony is a carrot, not a double uh, star. If I write this reaction, E2, 3A plus 5B goes to A plus 2C plus 9D, it will automatically generate four rate equations, one for A, one for B, one for C, one for D. The rate is always K times A cubed plus times B to the fifth. That's mass action in work. Uh, but it will automatically put in, I'm getting rid getting rid of three A's and getting one back, minus three, minus one, so minus two, minus five B's, because I'm not getting any back, plus two C's, plus nine E's. 
So if I have complicated rate, I have the complicated combinations of chemicals, it'll automatically keep track of all of that. Again, if I showed you this mess and asked you what the arrows were, not so obvious. Going forward is easy. Okay. There are a couple of other things. As I mentioned, in some cases, we don't care what was being used to produce A. If we're doing production of RNA or, or protein, we don't want to have to keep track of all of the components. And so I can write nothing goes to A at a rate K. This would be constant rate of synthesis of A. And that's allowed E1 colon nothing goes to A at a rate. I can have decay. A goes to nothing. In reality, matter is conserved. So it's not that nothing produces a molecule or the molecule becomes nothing. But I don't care about what those products or sources are. A goes to nothing. Uh, first order decay is typical. If, if I have nothing goes to A, typically the rate on the left, the rate depends on the thing on the left. If there's nothing on the left, Typically, the only the natural thing I get is a constant rate. If I have A decaying, I don't want my decay to go net to create a negative value. And so the simplest thing is what's called first order decay, K times A, which gives me exponential decay. Turns off when I run out of A. A goes to nothing is allowed. That's a typical decay term. If I have a bunch of arrows with A and B in them, Tellurium will, and antimony will sum up the results. So if I have forward and backward rates, I write them separately. Antimony will automatically add them together. If I really want to write an ODE, I can. Prime does that. T prime equals beta times T times V is allowed. That would generate the equation dt by dt equals beta times t times v. t prime is equivalent to writing nothing goes to t, but with a semicolon instead of an equal sign. There are some slight differences in the way t prime and nothing goes to something are interpreted, though. So. If you're really going to write ODEs, probably using the T prime equals is a better notation. As I mentioned, things get summed up. Nothing goes to T at a rate T at K0. V plus T goes to I1 at a rate K1 times T times V. Here I have T being created. Here I have T being destroyed. If I look at my T equation, T is being created from the first arrow and destroyed from the second arrow. What about V? V is being used up in the second equation. T plus V goes to I1. It's not being created anywhere, so it's only one term. What about I1? I1 is being created from T and V. It's being turned into D here. So I have two terms, K1 TV minus K2 I1. And D is only being created, so I get one term, K2I1. If I really want to go from ODEs backwards, I look for what are called balances. So let me just turn on annotation for a second. If I wanted to try to guess what the arrows were that generated these equations, what I would look for is K1TV shows up here. And they both have a minus sign. That means that they're on the left-hand side of an arrow, and they're on the, they have the same rate, so they're likely to be in the same arrow. So that suggests that. I can have the same term here, but with a plus, that suggests that I1 belongs on the right-hand side of an arrow. 
The problem is if I have something that's both created and destroyed, there may be ambiguity about how things are done. Uh, this happens in a lot of things like population models. If I have an equation that says how rapidly a tumor is growing, the tumor's growth will depend on the rate at which I'm creating cells and the rate at which I'm killing cells. But the rate law for the tumor size only tells me what the net difference between creation and destruction is. And so without some additional information, I don't know whether uh, which, which pieces of which process are contributing. So that's, I hope, uh, helps a little bit for that. Um, if you have stacked reactions, then you'll see things that are very clear, where you'll see in the ODEs, you'll see pairs, where you'll see K1TV here balances K1TV there, K2XY balances K2XY, and so on. And that'll imply stacks of arrows. Okay. All parameter values must be defined. If you don't give a value from beta or V, uh, it will crash. And you have to say what your time units are. And CompuCell will not automatically handle the time scaling, which is one reason that you really want to write those time scales here, because in the CompuCell, you're going to have to have something that converts whatever units of time you used in your antimony model into Monte Carlo steps. And you want to have that written out somewhere so you know what you did. Okay. Um, tellurium will, uh, antimony will, for variables, normally assign a value of zero to variables if you don't specify, like Fortran in the old days. It's a really bad idea to not specify the value. And there's some reasons for that. In particular, when you run antimony, antimony runs sequentially. It's a transformation on the state of the system. Uh, and so it's, it's, uh, you can get, it's pretty confusing if you don't uh, know where you started, because it's possible you inherit something from something else. Antimony will also allow us to define functions, like a Python or C function. You can define def function such and such. Uh, we won't use that. Um, while antimony is primarily thinking of writing continuous time uh, rate laws, it does allow discrete time events. Uh, and antimony has a syntax, which we'll come back to not today, but in the next class, called at, which allows you to do something when something occurs. And that could be reasonably sophisticated, those ats. It could be at time 50. It could be at A bigger than B, at B less than 0.01, uh, any kind of condition. The way conditions play out is a little bit tricky um, because uh, at time bigger than 50, in principle, would happen every time. You know, once you get to time 50, it keeps happening. You, you don't want that in an event. And so events are triggered. They turn on when the state of the event, the argument of the event goes from false to true. And then they don't happen again until it goes back from false to true. Again, we'll come back to that when we need it. Something, you could do pretty sophisticated things, but it's not the way we're used to thinking of programming. It's really event-based programming. And it's what an antimony is what's called the declarative language. It's not a, it's not a universal programming language. Um, there are no loops in antimony. And if statements are a little bit different because if statements are continuously evaluated and they're only at acts and they're only executed when the argument goes from false to true. And that's not what we're used to in, 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 in uh, in, in procedural languages. And so we do have to think just the way going between arrows and ODEs takes a little bit of getting used to. Um, it's not very complicated. There are not many things we have to remember, but they're not quite the same. 
uh, in atom money. It's not our standard language. I don't know if people work with declarative languages before, uh, but they're a little bit different. Okay. So everybody's got this running. Um, the sum, but did I ask you to show, show me what you got when you ran this model? Somebody, if it's all, you already did it. So somebody else is, everybody said they got this working. So somebody else, do you want to show us what you got when you run this phone? I can show mine off. Sure, thanks, Al. And if this is incredible, there you go, exponential decay, not very exciting. Yeah. Okay, good. Thank you. Pretty simple. <clears throat> but, but the point of this exercise, in a sense, is for you to be telling me this is so simple. Why do you need to tell me about it? Because you can actually do very elaborate things starting with this very simple structure. And again, one of the things I really love about antimony is it is simple. And you could do a lot with it. Okay, thank you. So here was our result. Um, one thing is you have to edit that variables line to tell it what to display. So if I put, if I only had T in, it would only produce T. If I do T colon red, it will put T in in red, I1 colon blue. I could put E1 and give it a different color. And so that one variables line lets me, tells me what I'm gonna put in my display. Now in practice, I could use all the typical CompuCell and, and functions for doing plots, but the idea and the whole point of this little exercise, the Tellurium exercise, was so you didn't have to do that. You didn't have to create your plot windows on your own. You didn't have to create your plot series. It's all predefined. All right. And that's all you need to do to run a network model. Let's try just a little bit more elaborate one. Um, Let's try the chemical reaction A plus B goes to C. And here, remember that you'll have to change the variables you're plotting, A, B, and C. So why don't people try that one out? I'll give you a minute to do that. One thing I'll warn you about with antimony, uh, and I've since I've run these myself, I know I'm not doing it here is that if you name a parameter, a variable reserved word in antimony, it will crash and it won't give you an informative error. And so especially you wanna be cautious about things like Greek letters, because for example, gamma is a gamma function predefined. So, and pi is predefined. So if you're going to give things Greek letter names, put a one at the end of it. Do something to make sure that it's not a, not a reserve word. And if you get a weird crash, um, sometimes the weird crash will be because of mismatched parentheses or a missing semicolon. Uh, but if you get a really weird crash, um, the likelihood is pretty high that you accidentally gave a variable name something that antimony thinks is a reserve word. And if anybody needs, uh, uh, I don't think E, I think E is all right. But gamma and pi are definitely not all right. Time is a reserve word. I'm sure somewhere there's a list of all of them. But he's, and if anybody needs any help getting this working, let me know. Everybody, everybody okay with it? So um, this one is not so exciting. Uh, if I started out with no A, B, and C, did nothing happen for people? That was a bit of a trick, right? If I don't have any A, there's no reaction. So now try uh, different amounts of initial A. Try A is one, A three, five, 10, and 15. So 
Somebody tell me what happened. You obviously, you can't make it all, all five at once, but it only takes a few seconds to change. I guess I could have said, Joel, you do one, Connor, you do three, Alex, you do five, Joel, I should do. It only takes fast enough. I don't have to do that. If it were fancy, if it were complicated, I'd do that. What do you get? Something like that. Once I've used up A, the reaction stops. So if I start out with more B than A, I use up my A and it stops and I still have a lot of B. If I have a lot of A more than B, I use up all my B and the reaction stops. So I could be A limited if I start out with a lot of B. And if I could be B limited if I start out with a lot of A. And so that's, uh, that's usually I'm going to wind up with some leftover, either of A or B. Only if I start out with equal amounts of A and B do I wind up having the reaction go to completion. So that's sort of classic chemistry. All right, let's do something a little bit more interesting. Let's have A goes to B, B goes to C, C goes to D. And we'll use first order rate laws, KAA times A, KB times B, KC times C. And again, you'll have to relabel uh, here, A, B, C, you'll have to add comma D yellow. This kind of cascade reaction is happens in chemistry. It happens a lot in metabolism. Uh, if I included the back, the back reactions, then it would also be something like could be something like that MAP kinase cascade. Well, that's a little bit different because I'm not using up the, the regulators. And for the people who are, have it done already, you can play around changing the rate law, rates Ka, Kb, and Kc. It's particularly interesting if Ka, Kb, and Kc are equal to each other, or if you make Ka 10 times Kb, times, which is 10 times Kc, or vice versa, if they're harmonic ratios. You can get, if you make a long cascade, A goes to B, B goes to C, C goes to D, D goes to E, E goes to F, and you have Ka equals 1.1 times Kb, Kb equals 1.1 Kc, and so on. Uh, those uh, change that ratio. You can get some very interesting behaviors, maybe slightly unexpected ones. With just four layers, it's not so clear. Go to 10 layers if that's in there. And as always, if anybody finds something confusing or needs help, just say so. I'm not trying to rush you. 
but the purpose here is to just get a little bit of practice going from arrows to, to typing the equation. I mean, for the people who've, who've got the basic thing done, the other thing to do would be to make the cascade a little bit longer. So I say D goes to E, E goes to F, and so on. It makes it more or less. Another thing you might try if you've got the base exercise done would be to add as a variable R1 or whatever you named one of these rates and add it to the plot, see what that looks like. Could I share my code and have people sure. see if there's sure. a typo? I feel like... Something's off in how I've typed this. Um, ah, what's wrong? Oh my goodness. Okay, I see it. That was a silly mistake. I can stop sharing now. <laughs> yeah, that'll do it, won't it? As I say, unfortunately, the, the parser for antimony it's gotten a little bit better, but boy, it doesn't, it's not, not very informative. Is anybody else having pro any problems that maybe we should go over? Did it work now, Connor? Yeah, it works like a charm now. Okay. Okay, so again, in my steps, write each chemical reaction as an antibody reaction specification, define initial values for A, B, C, and D, define rate constants, and define the variables to be displayed. So here's what you get. At least I started with A and no B and C and D. Did people get something that looked a little bit like that? exponential decay of A, and then B comes up and then decays, and then C comes up a little bit later, and then D comes up and eventually all of the A gets turned into D. So that's the basic result. Okay, try doing what I suggested, which is making, here we made K, K all the K is the same. Try making KA1, 
KB10 and KC100 and run that. And then after that, try making KA1, KB.1, and KC.01. As I mentioned, that one, it, it's a little bit more dramatic if you have more, more layers, but it's actually to be quite an interesting result. Does somebody want to show one and somebody else want to show the other? Josh, are you getting this to work? Yeah, I got it to work. You want to show one of these two? You want to do one, 10, 100? Or? Uh, I just got done doing the second one. Oh, okay. I'm sorry. So uh, you're. I can show that. Okay. No, the, the 1.1 and 0.01. Okay. You've got one, one. Okay. Sure. Let's see what you got. I don't want to put you on the spot. I just thought. No, so I can't. I have a lot of uh, desktops open, and for some reason, Zoom won't recognize the one that I have. I can share just the the graph for some reason, but I don't hmm. know why. But this is uh... okay. Can everyone see that? Yeah, that looks great. Okay. So what you're seeing here is A goes down very quickly, B comes up more slowly, and then C is coming up. Each Basically, you're seeing the time scales are different. There's a factor of 10 difference in the time scale, because that's what those are rate, rate constants. And so each succeeding reaction is 10 times slower than the reaction before. D is super slow. So for this, we'd have to wait a long time for it to work, but that looks great. This is a case we're running it inside of CompuCell. It, it takes longer than it would take to run it as a freestanding simulation. Um, you're paying for all the overhead of CompuCell, which you're not really used. <clears throat> but what you'd see if you ran this as a big cascade is that the, the height of the peaks would be the same with these factors of 10, approximately the same. The green will peak out at the same height, the red will peak, the pink will peak out at the same height. Um, the first one and the last one are always different. But if we had a cascade, they'd all have approximately the same height. Each one would be 10 times slower than the previous one, I think. Did anybody do the, uh, the other one, 110, 100? I did. Um, okay, let's take a look. Uh, so this is my setup. I had a no. uh, larger setup. So I went from 0 0.01 all the way to 100. Perfect. Uh, and so what you see in that one, which is sort of is the opposite. In, in, the, in the one where they get slower, the peak heights are all the same, but the time scales slowed down. In this one, basically everybody peaks at the same time, but the heights of the maxima go down by a factor of 10. And so you have these two limiting cases where the maximum height of each, each reactant is the same, but the time of reaction gets stretched out. 
or one where the time of the reaction is the same, but the maximum amount gets stretched out. And to me, it's interesting that the same reaction network by picking different chemical reaction rates can give such different results. There's some other interesting intermediate cases that you can get as well. Um, but I think, I think those are the two main results from this. Okay, thanks very much for sharing that. And so, yes, the last one we've already done was to add, um, okay, so the last one is gonna be chemical equilibrium. So there's one more thing. We've had a cascade, A goes to B, B goes to C, C goes to D. In the end, that converts all of our A to D. Add one extra line, D goes back to A and see what happens. And this is the last one that I exercise I had planned for today and then I'm turning it over to Giuliano. So you wanted to show something. This is what's called a cyclical reaction. If I drew it as a series of arrows, I'd have a loop. A goes to B, goes to C, goes to D, goes back to A. And it's quite different. I, I can show you if you wanna see. I did sure. a little bit with more variables, but... That's okay. If you have more, it's all right. It doesn't, doesn't change the mix. The only thing that matters is to come back to the beginning. Yeah. I also slowed down every reaction so we could see it better. But yeah. Nice braided picture. So you'll notice in the first one where you have it open, all of the A eventually gets turned into whatever your last species is, D or in your case, H. When they're not open, they all, you get some of everything. And in this case, you're gonna get, I think the same amount of everything. Yeah, and I have a different values for A, B, and C also initiate differently. That's why we are also seeing like they're starting in different right. places. But your rate constants are the same for each one. The right? same, yes, yeah. 0 0.1, just right. so we can see. Yeah. So then you get all the equal value for all of them. If you used a ratio of 10, then you get the, the just the way we said for AX goes to Y, Y goes to X, the final amount was the ratio of the two rates. Here you'll get the same thing. If the rates are bigger, you get more. Inward rate is bigger, you get more of the one that's in, less of the one that has a higher rate out. Again, that's a very simple chemical reaction, but there's actually a lot to explore with it. Uh, this is quite a bit you can do. So here's what you get here. And now, Maybe just try playing around a little bit with Ka, Kb, and Kc and Kd. Uh, again, to begin with, starting with ratios of two, one, two, four, eight is good, or or the reverse, one, one half, one quarter, one eighth, and one sixteenth. And that was really that's the end of what I had prepared for today, because uh, I wanted Giuliano to have time. Uh, so, you ready to? Do you want to take a five minute break and then and then take over, Juliana? So, you're welcome to take a short break. I know we ran over a little bit on time for before the break. Uh, if you don't want to take a break, you can play around, playing around with Ka, Kb, Kc, and Kd, and see what you get. They're actually sort of interesting results. Okay, so I'll see you back here at. Uh, 728 and Juliana will take it. Um, so I'm gonna 
do an overview of the steps and I think it might be easier if somebody else actually goes through the steps and does it and already gets their project started rather than me, especially because I've done test NanoHub tools before and NanoHub has chastised me about it. So I'm not going to do it again. Um, so there are a few steps. Uh, first, you're going to have to fork the template repository, which is right here, and it's going to be in chat now. Then you have to clone this repository from online to your local machine, and that's getting to GitHub lingo, which I'm not going to go over, but it's easy enough. Then test the script that, uh, that is here, Toolmaker that will create your tool just to see how it works. And when you actually use the Toolmaker script, you have to choose a short handle for your tool. And that's the only thing you will not be able to change ever again. Okay, okay. Um, then use the script to actually uh, get your files ready and stuff. Um, your NanoHub tools need a bunch of files to actually work that are not related to CompuCell. Then you commit and push all of your local changes to the online repository. You have to make sure that files here in bin and middleware stay executable. Uh, the script is supposed to do that, but it doesn't work for some files for some reason. I mean, can't figure out why. Then finally, we're going to go into NanoHub and get the steps going there. There's a form to fill. And the first thing in the form is a tool name, which is the short handle that you chose. You make the landing page. You say that your code is committed, working, and ready to be installed. You wait a few days to get it up. But before there, that, you already get issue a ticket requesting that your tool gets upgraded to the Debian 10 environment. Then wait a few days and test your tool online and give the go ahead to have the tool go live. So you're going to need a few things. An NanoHub account, which makes sense. A GitHub account to do the whole interfacing and whatnot have some sort of program to interface with github i use git bash but there's github desktop which has an actual gui which might be easier for some people i i, I started when i learned github with that but i got fed up and switched to terminal use um yeah and you have you may set up github to make your life easier or not and to have your CC3 project, really just the folder with the CC3 file and the simulation folder. And to be able to run Python from the console window. In my case, I'm going to use Anaconda here. And that has Python. So again, steps. Uh, fork the template repository, which is in chat. But since people dropped, I'm gonna paste that again. This green button here. Oh, nice. This green button here forks the repository. You're gonna see a page like this. You give it a name. I have a standard for my NanoHub tools, but that's me. Um, give it a short description. Make sure that it's set to public uh, for it to be visible to NanoHub afterwards. And then you're going to see a page that looks like this. Uh, your name, the repo name, and then generated from this repository. This already has more stuff that was there from before. 
that's neither here nor there. The next step is to go here in code where was used as template before. Copy that link. Go to whatever you're using to interface with GitHub, which in my case is Git Bash. Navigate to where you want your NanoHub tool to live afterwards and do a git clone. Oops. Uh, git clone didn't actually paste the link. Clone that. There we go. Now we come here. There's a bunch of stuff. Let's remove uh, main because that's spoilers. But never mind that. But the important thing is that. It's cloned and you should be somewhat like this, which is just a mirror image of what was online. Then I'm gonna get this. Then next thing, next thing is to actually test the tool maker script. Uh, there. Having to switch between Linux style and Windows style commands always trips me up. Um, so just to see what happens, I'm gonna do a Python and then toolmaker.py and it prints out how to use it. Um, it's gonna be Python, the script, then short tool name, which is that short handle that you cannot change ever again. Full path to the new directory, which I recommend using the place that you cloned your fourth repository but it still needs to be full path. I am yet to implement uh, relative paths to this. And then the full path to your CC3D project, meaning the folder that has the .cc3D file. So if I were to do that, I'm gonna do that uh, test. Because in my case, that's fine. In our case, that's not fine. The folder that I'm at, and then let me choose a model. Back to your macrophage. We were doing that last week. Then full path paste. Why is it not paste? Hmm. So Python to maker.py test, which is the short handle, the folder I'm at, and the folder that has the .cc3 file. When I hit enter, um, bunch of things get printed out. Um, and a new folder appears. I do here again. Now the middleware folder shows up again, which was the folder that I deleted before. Middleware? No. So now Oh, actually, the main folder, sorry, not middleware. Now we can actually check what things got changed here by going back to git bash and doing a git status. 
uh, in my case, it looks a bit different because I deleted a bunch of stuff, but we see that main got added. And I want to add all of the changes uh, to my commit to get it online later. So I'm going to do git add period, which Linux for this folder right here. And if I do a git status again, yes. now we see that there's a bunch of new files deleted, modified. In your case, it's going to look more like here on the right, which just modified and a bunch of new files. Now I have to, I've added everything. Now I have to actually issue the a commit message, a commit and have a message. Um, let's just go with start. And when I get those things from in my computer to online by pushing them online with git push. And now things should be here. Oh, sorry, wrong GitHub repository, this one. And we see the message there, start. So almost done with GitHub. Everything is online already, but we need to check two things. First, that the files here in bin are executable. You can do that by going to the file and it's going to say right there if it is executable. Then if I go to the other one, oh, okay, this one is also executable. Is it actually working this time just because? Okay, in my case, they are all executable, but usually that doesn't work. Uh, so you can do i have the command here that oops sorry that has a mistake it's missing a slash that and that so that's going to make all the files in those folders executable. You, then you need to actually issue a new add, add, add all the changes again and issue a new commit and get those two changes online with a push again. So now we are done with GitHub onto NanoHub. To create a tool, if you have your NanoHub be wider like this, it's going to be on resources, upload, publish, resources again, and tools on the bottom of the page. And here is the point that I'm going to stop doing stuff because I don't want NanoHub to be mad at me again. But you have to fill out this form. Tool name here is the short handle that you chose before. They must be exactly the same. The short handle cannot have spaces. Uh, it can have letters and numbers. And I can never remember if dash or underscore is fine. So just in case, don't use either. And it needs to be in between 3 and 15 alphanumeric characters. For some reason, the instructions for tool name are here, far away from the box where that information would be useful. Then you give it a title. That's totally up to you, and that's changeable. The only thing you can change is tool name, which is the short handle. Everything else you can change later. So title, version, uh, one sentence, abstract, um, then you have to tell NanoHub where you're hosting your tool, which is a Git repository on GitHub. Git repository URL is this link here, 
the one you get from code, not what is up there, but code and then copy. And publishing option, it is Rapture or Linux GUI that you want. And everything else should also probably be defaults. Anybody should be able to run your tool. I mean, you can make your code closed source if you want. Uh, and then on development team, I do recommend adding me. That way I may be more able to help. And also add whoever you, your group is here, of course. Uh, after you register your tool, let me go to my messages. You're going to see, probably be able to see. You're going to see a page that looks like this one. Um, if your if your code is online and it's workable, you can already say that my code is committed, working, ready to be installed, so that you can test it on NanoHub. Sometimes things don't work on NanoHub for some reason. Um, also, to make the page that describes your tool, that's going to be the landing page. If I go to the COVID page, for for instance. Uh, this one, I'm pretty sure. Yeah, so this is the page describing your tool, the landing page. And that's it. So after you hit my code is committed, working, and ready to be installed, or wherever I thought you could click here on message and ask here that my tool short handle needs to be upgraded to the Debian 10 environment, but I think that doesn't work. You actually have to go to um, the ticket issuing thing here on about. In my case, because I had it kind of short it's there, but support tickets. new tickets and that's pretty much it once you get it online you can run it on nanohub check that things work and that's all so i would say that's not the most transparent workflow in the universe it's, no it's rather no. long and complicated yep yeah I, I mean it's not it's not your fault it's how nanohub works but but if everybody could remember all those steps, I'm amazed. Yep. And, and that's why I would like to ask somebody to actually go through the steps here and now sharing the screen so that we can help out. Um, Juliano, I might confess, mm -hmm. I, after my computer crashed, I start doing the things you were doing, but then I decided to create an environment to do everything instead of doing it on my main machine. It will take a while. <laughs> and you moved so fast on some parts that I like, it's, I'm not saying that's your fault or anything like that. I know that you did this most for the video that we can go back and rewatch it, mm -hmm. but I don't remember all the steps. So especially on the time that that I have right now, that we yeah. have right now, 10 minutes, I think it will be, but it, we can try, I can try to do that for the next class. If you want to see if, if everything worked well. I mean, does anybody want to try walking through at least part of this now? It's not that I'm not open to trying. The, the issue is, is that I am a relatively um, recent programmer having come from a not competitional background. So I'm not even familiar with GitHub. Um, 
for the most part. So I am anticipating that I'll actually have to sit down and unpack some of the very basic things that just happened. Yeah, but you really only need to know two commands and mostly verbs. That's well, okay. I mean, yeah. why don't you why don't you walk him through the basics of downloading his tool to GitHub to, to, to getting his from put yep. it to GitHub? That might be that's useful in, in its own right. Yep. That's For today, true. we can spend a few minutes doing that and, and uh, Okay, so I should go to GitHub? Yes, okay. and share your screen. Okay. Everyone see GitHub? Yes. Awesome. Okay, so first is to actually go to uh, the template repository, which I just dropped in chat again. Yep, then use this template. Give it a name. Now, do you do you have anything to interface uh, with GitHub? Like um, let me check. A long time ago, I had to use GitHub Desktop, but that might have been on a different computer. Nope, I have GitHub Desktop. It just probably has my I don't know if it'll link to my, yeah, it's going to link to my old account, so. Okay, yeah. Not too familiar with Git desktop anymore. Uh, I am also happy to get any other interface that you would feel more comfortable assisting with. Yep, let's go to Git bash. Uh, I appreciate your patience. I know this probably has to feels like teaching someone how to walk right now. No, I mean GitHub is very useful and stuff, but it, it is arcane at the at the start. Just gonna trust all the default settings. <laughs> Given that we're on a five minute time constraint, it's probably not the time to read through them. Do read the full license. I, I'm assuming you wouldn't send me to any software that is going to wreck my computer. <laughs> no, I wouldn't do that. So this is an ex this is like one big trust fall right now. This is where I'm at. 
Okay. Perfect. Um, you can navigate to wherever you want your tool to, well, the repository to be. Um, right now you are under your user. See users, your username. Okay. If, that, if that's okay with you. That's we'll just do that for now. Let's, let's. Okay, yeah. So then the command is uh, git clone and you need the link from your repository. Okay, so that was this. Yes, no, not that link. The not one this. under code. The green button code. Oh, oh. okay. Yep. There we go. I need to move your faces so I can find the tab again. There we go. Okay. So is it one? No, it's two. Git space clone space the link. Hello? Uh, middle mouse button or shift insert. Or right clicking the top bar. Yep, okay, that there we also go. Also works. Enter and it's gonna create the NanoHub2 folder. So if you CD into it, space NanoHub2. A tab should auto complete now. That's fun. Mm -hmm. LS is going to list everything in there that is not hidden. Okay. So. Yep. Just LS. Um, and now you need to be able to run Python. Okay. Uh, from the command line, which worst case scenario means opening a command line in CompuCell's, uh, well, opening a command line and using the Python that comes with CompuCell, which means yet another full path, but that's the worst case scenario. So try just doing Python there, see what happens. Doesn't work. Uh, I think I can. I do. If you do, oh, if you have Anaconda, you can launch up Anaconda prompt. Okay. Wait. Here. Uh, CMD XE prompt or yeah, PowerShell also works. Okay. I feel like it shouldn't be taking this long. Yeah, that's why I usually go with the Windows menu route. Okay, let me. Here. I do not like Anaconda's launcher. Sometimes it gives me yep, issues. There, there, there it goes. Doesn't know if it wants to stay open or not. We're back here. <laughs> uh, yeah. Would you like me to do something other than press this button? There was an nope. inhale. Okay. Um, okay, this time it isn't. Okay, this time it went. Okay. Fast. Yeah, so navigate to where you had the stuff, which I think is under the, should be, if you do LS, 
hit enter uh, why it's in windows so oh this is because okay well there it is nano hub tool is. so yeah just cd into that Oh. Yep. Now do Python two maker. A tab should well, it's an underscore, but delete uh, get rid of maker and press tab. Or two and then tab. Yep. And there you have how to use it. Okay. So now um hit up on the arrows on your keyboard. Now space, choose your name wisely. Um, this is for the project? Yes. Uh, half of my, half of my <laughs> high find isn't even here. If you, if it makes things easier, nobody is gonna see that name. It's just gonna be part of the URL, and it's how okay. you know, have gets things organized. Okay. There, that's a neutral enough name. Yep. And I think that's under fifteen characters. Please yes, it is. Nine, twelve. Yep, that should be fine. Okay. Uh, space. Now select uh, on the left the C uh, users gonna nano have to that whole string. Wait, I'm. Yes. Yeah. This. Yeah, but without the greater than just C colon backslash user backslash. This. Yeah. Okay. Hit enter to copy. I think. Oh my goodness. Maybe it's just copied already. Uh, right click. Just right click over here. Yep. Hmm. Maybe not. Um, I can just type yeah. it probably, yep. right? Do it the old fashioned way. Yep. And tabs should help with auto completion stuff. Okay. Okay. Space, and now the full path to it where your project.cc2d file is. So, okay. Versions, which one to use and guess it's what's going on in your mind. Well, ver current, currently it's the, the main version that I have been working on is incredibly broken because I just recently <laughs> broke it. Um, you can change that later. That's okay. fine. The only thing you can change is the Evo multi cell. Okay. I'm also trying to remember exactly because I am was in the middle of reorganizing files, which means that right now they're more disorganized. So I'm also trying to remember <laughs> which. Um, Suppose I can look. Okay. Uh, yeah, okay. This is the one that it was in. Oh, I didn't see any CC2D files there. No, no, no. It, it's um, it was in, it was under the multicellular v2 file. Um, okay. it wasn't just embedded one layer. Okay. Well, a Control C right click should work if you go back to the Windows Explorer or the folder. I have to move all your faces again. <laughs> um. Okay. 
Yeah, it's in here. Yeah, yeah. So select the path at the top. Okay. For the to write, or yeah, copy address as text. Hopefully. Then on the PowerShell window, right click should paste that. Uh, yeah, so you have a space on the path. So add a quotation mark there at the end and then uh, before C colon there, yeah. So shell, you actually have to use the arrow keys. So oh. backspace once and then, yep. And move. Move, yeah. Reminiscent of before the 90s. Well, that should be one space over to the right. So, yep. Okay. Now hit enter and that should work. Okay. Yep. Cool, I think that worked. Uh, if you go back to Git Bash and Git space status, Yep, seems to be there. So now do a git space add space period. Um, git status again, you can double tap the up arrow. So we can see that everything is there. So now git space commit. Uh, space dash m for message dash m. Oh. Uh, no dash not slash. Oh. Yep. Um. Then a space uh, quotation marks and some message it can be whatever you want. This is what this feels like right now. Yep, uh, close quotes, enter, and git space push. Ah. Hopefully that's not too annoying. Did it open anything? Yeah, shouldn't that prompt something? Yeah, sure. Um, oh, there we go. Ah, uh, yep. Okay. Okay. Um, yep, that worked. So now if you go back to your repository online and do a refresh, you're going to see the stuff there. That a hello world for the stuff that you changed. So now let's check that the stuff in bean and middleware are executable. Click in one of those files. It's not, it doesn't say executable on the upper left. Okay. Um, yeah, so go back to git bash and do that. And that, and middle. Oh, you're sending chats. Okay, <laughs> I thought you were just saying that. Um, okay, so. Uh, I don't know why there is a bunch of stuff that got copied with everything, but yeah, backspace, because I think you have a to do there. Yeah. Pasting it again or? Yeah, I, 
think the extra is from doing control stuff. Okay, so just right click, paste. Yep, yep. There we go, okay. Enter, and then the other one. Uh, get status again. You see that those were modified. So now get space add space period. And get space commit space dash M space quotations message quotations. Okay, so this get space commit. commit. Yep. Dash and then, M. okay. And then quotations. Yep. Yeah, then type a message, close quotations, and hit enter again. So now okay, type okay. a message. Close quotations, yep. Enter, yep. And now git space push. Get stuff pushed online. And that's all for the GitHub site. Now we go to NanoHub. You can refresh that page and you're going to see the executable show up there. OK. All right, so now NanoHub. Uh, yeah, resources on the upper bar thing. Yep. Um, oh, sorry, it's moving faces. What, um, upload and publish? Yep. OK. Resources. Uh, scroll down and there's going to be tools somewhere there. Okay. Tool name must match what you typed in before. Yeah. Um, if you ever forget, I think it was Evo multi cell, but I'll double check before I do anything. <laughs> yeah. If you, if you ever forget, you can go to your, uh, the repository that has everything. Uh, yeah, go to the main page, then uh, middleware, go into that file. Evo multi cell, yeah. Yeah, Evo multi cell. Okay. Title you can change later. Okay. Um... At a glance, you can also change later. Uh, you can change later. You can literally put the same as the title or just glance. There. Yep. Then the repository host is uh, Git repository on GitHub. And you put the same URL used for cloning in there. Okay. So that was. Yep. Yep. And it is a Rapture or Linux GUI. So that's as it should be. Then to access and whatever else up to you. But. Okay, I, I think all that is fine. And I, I mean, I should go ahead and add you here yep. now, right? Yep. And I can also, I don't know what Andrew's GitHub is. So I'll have to do that later. I'm assuming that's one of the things that I can add in. Yes. Okay. Okay. So now I just register tool. Yeah, sometimes the this page hangs. Yeah, but it, yeah. Okay. So there you go. All right. Yeah. So now um, you can already send a message there on the left, uh, saying that. So scroll down a bit. So there oh, is here. The develop. Yeah, there. 
um, this shoe tool should be upgraded to Debian. Uh, thanks. Okay. Worst case, they're gonna say, yeah, you need to actually issue a ticket for that. No, uh, this too should be upgraded to Debian 10. They don't oh, care oh. about your stuff. Oh, okay, wait, wait, wait. To what, this is a Zoom, this is an earbud quality thing that's happening right now. <laughs> that. Oh, okay, that makes, that, that was definitely a mishearing moment. Okay, and then. Yeah, send message. Um, and once you get your code working and updated on GitHub, you can do the, my code is working, committed working and ready to be installed. Okay. Then a few days later, you're gonna get a message saying that it's actually online. And in the meanwhile, you can do the make the page that describes your tool, create this page. And it's a full HTML editor, so you can put anything there, really. Right here? Yep. I see. OK. Yep. Um, I won't leave that. This is public right now, I think. No, it's not public. Oh, yet. it's not. OK. In that case, yeah. there we go. Um, and then yeah, does that auto save or ah, no, saving? Go. Save and, go next. Yeah. and you can upload files, images, uh, presentations, whatever. OK. Yeah, and there you can add more authors. So Andrew, whenever you find out his user. OK. But yeah. OK, so for right now, I can just probably leave it here, right? Yeah. Yep. OK. OK, well, that was uh, much less overwhelming with someone to walk through it with. So thank you for that. Yeah, no worries. It, it, it is a lot, but it sounds a lot more than it is. Yeah, it's definitely, I, I oh, yep. No, I was going to say, it's definitely something, though, where having somebody walk you through it is important. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I've definitely noticed that having um, had a mixed bag for uh, technology where I've learned part of it myself and then a smaller part of it I've learned in class. It's always mm -hmm. interesting. Uh, some things are documented really well, both in terms of techniques and otherwise, but some stuff uh, you can bang your head into it for hours and feel like you're doing witchcraft mm -hmm. yes so so no that that was that was good i i think that will that also makes me feel better to have part of that step done because i've been doing most of the programming for this class on desktop just because it runs smoother um which is great uh the downside of that means of course that i've had less time to build up familiarity with nano hub mm -hmm. Yeah, but if any of you had been using NanoHub, I don't think this would have been familiar at all. Well, that's reassuring in a very unfortunate kind of way. Yeah. But, okay, well, hopefully that'll be help. Everyone else being able to see me fumble through that will be, um, yeah. Yep. Well, thank you for sticking that out. I think that's great. And I was gonna say, I, I think probably we need to, to walk through somebody else and record it also online so that we have uh, a couple of examples. And we probably need, Giuliano, some, some, you to walk through the Git, creating the Git repositories too. So mm -hmm. we'll do that. Whether we do that in class or, or separately and then make the recording of that. I think it's important. Uh, anything else you had to go over, Connor, tonight? Or? No, I, I think that covers everything that needed to be done tonight. Okay, well, thank you, Juliano, for taking over. I appreciate it. Yep. And, uh, and thank you, Connor, for being the guinea pig on that. Okay. Happy to be of that. assistance. Okay, good night, everybody. Bye. Good night. <laughs>